Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plots, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Sweet potatoes are a southern staple. Today we're going to be planting them. Also, we're going to be talking about how to avoid injuring yourself in the garden. That's just ahead on the Family Plots, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Walter Battle. Walter is a UT County Director in Haywood County, and Andrea Jacobo will be joining us later. Hi, right, while we're out in the Family Plot Garden. Yes. Sweet potatoes. Yes. Man, yes. I love sweet potatoes, man. Oh, yes. And, and, and I'll tell you, they are just a wonderful, wonderful plant, uh, wonderful vegetable to eat. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I even uh, bought one along here. Uh, and this is really the size that you really would like to, to get them. You can really bake them. Oh, yes. At this size love or whatever. And, and just a wonderful, wonderful uh, vegetable mm -hmm. uh, for the garden. And, you know, a lot of times, Chris, people will say, well, our sweet potatoes are yams. Ah, yeah, and they're actually not the same. So they are different. Plant. They're, uh -huh. they're, they're, they are different. But because the terms are just used so much, you know, interchangeably, uh, what the USDA require that any time on a sweet potato product that's processed, that they put in parentheses yams beside it. Wow, how Because, that? you know, the terms get, yeah. you know, in interchanged a lot. But I know today we're here to plant some, sure. <laughs> obviously. And um, let me just say this, uh, it's real simple. Uh, all you really need is some good till soil. Okay. Uh, and um, you, what you want to do, you want to ridge the soil up at least 10 inches high. Okay, wow. And you want to make it about a foot wide. So using this good shovel here, <laughs> they provide me, and you just, you know, real simple there. Just turn that up and put it there. Let me get a little bit more here. Okay. And... Um, and then that, notice that this way here has provided us, uh, you know, about 10 inches high. Ah, I got you, okay. And then what we're gonna do, and let me just uh, set this shovel right here. We're going to now get our sweet potatoes. Now, uh, let Which me just- Which ones do you have? Which ones do yeah, you like? Yeah, this here so, is the Beauregard, but, yes. but let me tell you, the, the Beauregard and the Vardaman are the two varieties that you see a lot in the stores because they have a really good shelf life and okay. all that, that the plant breeders have have bred for. But, you know, really good flavor, good taste. Uh, the Georgia Jets, very, very good. The Bunch Puerto Rico is a very good potato. And also, for those who really like the old varieties, that old Centennial is a very yeah. good sweet potato. Uh, that's probably the one that we grew up yeah, with, yeah. you yeah, know. Yeah. And, uh, and, and but, but it is very, very uh, susceptible to uh, diseases, the Centennial is. Okay. And uh, speaking of uh, insects and things like that, White flies, to me, tend to be the biggest problem hmm. with um, the um, uh, sweet potatoes. They do affect them uh, okay. pretty bad. Um, and you can get into some issues of weed control. Yeah. Uh, but if you have grass, you can use, you know, post or something like right, that to right. clean up the grasses. Okay. But pretty much sweet potatoes uh, pretty much take care of themselves. Now, I will warn you, uh, deer... <laughs> We'll eat them. They, they will eat them. And obviously, if you live somewhere where they have wild hogs, they'll root them up too. But, oh, you know, how about that? You know, hopefully you don't have any wild hogs running now, around. What about the, what about the uh, wild worms? Are we yes, wild you worms? always want to plant sweet potatoes in ground that has been previously uh, planted. And, right. and, and this is the garden plot here that's been previously planted. Yes. Otherwise, if you put it in turf grass that's never been planted before, you're going to get wild worms. Yeah. So we always like to stress, stress that. Now, okay. in planting these, uh, I will start right up here. Um, basically, again, you want your ridge to be about 10 inches high, and you want it to be about a foot uh, wide. And as you can see, that's about a foot wide there. I've done this so long, I, I, I don't need a ruler. <laughs> yeah, good um, job. And basically, all I do, I just get here, and I just dig me a good piece of soil here. And I usually plant about 12, um, about 12 inches apart, and I just kind of heal these up, uh, you know. And this, this, I mean, they're 
this is going to be some good potatoes here. Okay. I can just tell. Does the soil type matter or um, pH or anything like pH, that? Uh, probably around the six, I would probably say six, five, six, six, something okay. along that line, six, seven. Okay. Um, so they, 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 and they'll do fine. Let me just dig here using this family plot trial. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> see that? That's about 12 inches okay. apart. And let me see. Go another one here. And this allows for it to have proper drainage. Sure. You know, that's that's what this is really getting us okay. right here. I have two more to go. And let me ask you about fertilizing. I mean, what would you recommend or do um, they need to planting, be fertilized? Okay. Uh, I would put down maybe a 6-12-12 at planting. Let me do that. Okay. And I have one more to go here. One more. Okay. And uh, I would use a 6-12-12 at planting. Uh, make sure that your lime is right. Obviously, get your soil test. And like you said, oh, that was a little leggy there. Let's just fix that one up. Uh, okay. And there you go right there. Okay. And uh, you should have some potatoes here probably, I believe about 100 days or so, oh, okay. you know, okay. uh, you'll be digging. And, um, you know, hey, Thanksgiving, sweet potato pie. Oh, yeah. Hey, this is I what you want right here, pie. candied yams. Uh, is there, but is there a way you can tell that they're ready? Well, it's kind of a little bit trial and error. Okay. But what happens, the... Uh, the, the vines would die back okay and uh, and, and that give you a good idea and then you would just want to come out here at some point when you know they're about ready maybe dig just by the side to kind of see okay. how they look and then you about know okay mm -hmm. now do they have to be stored once uh, we're ready yes. for harvesting yes once I, once I dig them I leave the dirt on them okay and I put them in milk cartons <laughs> you know the old milk cartons and I have one that sits up on the table that, you know, where, where air can circulate sure. up under it, is yeah. actually a big, long piece of wire that I can set it on. And just let them sit there for about two weeks, two or three weeks. They'll, they'll cure out good, and you'll have, you know, then, you, then you'll be ready to go with them. You ready to go? Yes. Yeah, I like those sweet potatoes. Oh, yeah, uh, they're good. They're good. good, they're good. All right, well, we appreciate the demonstration. Well, yeah, thank you for having me here, and I, I can't wait to come back can't and get some of these. Can't wait to see what's going to happen, all right? Thank yes, you much. Yes, sir. All right. <laughs>they have flat, umbel-like flowers, and they have little tiny blossoms that the little parasitoid bees and the hoverflies can feed on. So you look here, you'll see just could be dozens of little tiny insects. The parasitoid wasp are important because it gives them energy, that nectar, then they can go lay their eggs on caterpillars and do some biological control. The key to having a garden for, that's good for the bugs is have things blooming from early spring throughout the summer and in, into the fall, like asters in the fall. You want things that are going to attract all kinds of insects, and many of them are going to be uh, beneficial or pollinators. Andrea, thank hey. you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having right, me. No I'm glad problem. to be back and in the sun. In right. the sun. We are in the family plot garden. Yes. So what are we going to talk about today? So. Physical activity is something that's really important. Okay. Gardening is also something yes, very important, is. as yes, you can is. see, right? Yes. So what I want to do is talk about how gardening is a form of physical activity, okay. but also how to protect yourself so you can good. have, you can garden throughout the rest of your good, life. Good, good. I think that is so important. Very so important. important. And it's a lot of times when you hear, probably already, uh, when people come to your office and they say, I threw out my back. Uh -huh. <laughs> I can't move too much, I was gardening too much. So I want to show you how to properly okay. pick up things, heavy things, and as well as try to protect yourself while gardening. All right, good stuff. So good right stuff. here, what I have is a normal soil bag, right? Okay. So typically what you do, um, muscle pulls on bone. 
right? right? So that when I say that is because you have to make sure that everything in your body is in, a, in alignment so that when wow. you're picking up the, the bag, you can, full, you can use your full force. Okay. So what you do is you square the bag, you send your hips back, oh. you go into a squat, and what you that? grab the bag fully, and then you pick up it up with your legs. That's all. That's it. That's it. And the same thing ah. when you set it down. Okay. Just like so, right? Yeah. And most of us, what we just go down and just yeah, because you right? just grab it, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. Right. And yeah. that's not ergo ergonomically correct. Right. Okay. Because, like I mentioned, muscle pulls on bone, and so when you have everything in alignment, you'll be able to do it without any problems. How about that? Okay. Yeah. And so what I have here too, I have my okay. my little blanket, right? My little <laughs> extension blanket. Okay. So. <laughs> Um, you can use a blanket or a towel, okay. whichever one you prefer. You can fold it in half or fold it into threes, like so, or into multiple fours, depending on where you what you have okay. and what you you like. So you can place it on the ground, and uh -huh. then you can bring your knees onto it, and then you can reach bending at the hip, holding, gardening, grabbing at something, whatever right, you please. like, okay. and then you travel around the either a raised bed or wherever you are, are you're gardening and it helps protect the knees as well as maintain the back huh. yeah because that back is so important very you know, important when i was tra training before a lot of my clients that were elderly would throw out their backs because of their gardening wow. not okay. because they were you know doing a fast movement or catching a sprint it's, it's because gardening. of it's okay. through gardening so this was one way that i thought it would be very beneficial for the listeners to Sure. To know how to really pick up everything just in, in a good form. Now okay. I see you yeah. have a shovel. Yeah. yeah. So with shoveling, yeah. what are are you right-handed or left-handed? I'm right-handed. Okay. Yeah. So the same thing. You're gonna want to do opposite to your what you your dominant. So okay. you're gonna have your left foot forward. Let's now see. you can either use the legs to fully bend at the knee and then pick up what you're needed to pick up and use your legs as well. Same thing. You can use the right leg bring your foot down, whatever you're trying to do with your shovel. Okay. That's one of the things that you could do. Like I mentioned, muscle pulls on bone. Muscle, yeah. So you want to make sure that everything's in alignment. So the knees are over the ankle. Over the, the ankle. Yeah, and the foot is right behind you. So it has that added support. So you can bend at the knee and then you can pick it up. Oh, that's good stuff. Yeah. Right okay. So now okay. The, the most important part Right. When you're finishing most gardening, most important part, more most important important okay. part is that you need to stretch after. All right. we got to, yeah. So there's a couple exercises that you could do. Okay. You can either just do a forward bend to touch your toes, All right. or come back up, flex the foot, and then reach down, bending the knee, the other knee, okay. and slightly touching your toes so it could go straight into the hamstring oh, and okay. the and the calves. Now. Also, depending on what you your what you feel, so what you did the most, okay. you can also do a quad, okay. quadricep, which is your front part of your leg. Right. So you grab one hand, grab the ankle, and pull it Ooh, towards wow. you. Now this is also balancing. Yeah. I have a trick for you. Okay. So, if you're wobbling, hold your opposite ear. Your balance really? is in, yeah. Your balance ah. is in your ear, so you can hold yourself up just like so. Oh. Then you bring it down and do the other side. That's all. Okay. And then you just hold your ear. And then bring it back down. Wow. Yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah. Let's that's that. that's that's how you hmm. prevent injuries. Okay. By stretching, making sure you're 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 picking up things in the correct manner, and then also having a trusty blanket or a towel to help you with your raised beds or whenever you're you're low to the ground. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you about this. What about those of us who have wheelbarrows and we right. have you know soil in the wheelbarrow what's the proper way to move same the, thing same, okay. same thing also making sure that your weight is okay. on your heels you bend back hold the wheelbarrow oh, yeah. i'm imagining a wheelbarrow right. and then you just pick up <laughs> from your legs from your and legs. then you walk forward okay same thing that prepares the body to know that it's going to move in, f in a forward direction huh. so that all your muscles are activated as you're pushing the wheelbarrow Okay. Are there any exercises for folks that use pruners a lot that you could think of for your hands? Yes. Okay. So when you when 
when you finish pruning, you can place your hands behind in, fr in front of you at, in a wall and then ah. slightly come down. It stretches out the forearm and okay. the biceps and also the hands. The hands, okay. There's muscles even to the, mus the fingertips. So you oh, really okay. have to, that's a great way to stretch. Wow. Mm -hmm. So you can really get in some good gardening exercises. Yes. Right? Do you know how many calories you burn in an hour for gardening? How many? 300. 300? Oh, 300 calories, good, a moderate activity. And it's because there's always higher bouts of intensity. So you, when you're picking up the wheelbarrow, yeah. when you're walking with a heavy bag of soil, that's in higher intensity than actually just pruning or you're just um, harvesting, whichever, whatever you're doing in the garden. There's always varied bouts hmm. of intensity. So that's very beneficial for our heart and for our muscles. Wow, this is good stuff because we don't think about this when we're no, out there gardening, do we? No, we don't. Especially when we're younger. We just think, oh, we just go down and just grab this <laughs> yeah. and just walk off. I know wow. that I've been, you know, one of the main, main, main things that I need for my, for my kids when I tell them what to do, they have to make sure they have maintained good form. That way, throughout their whole life, yeah. they can maintain that. Andrea, yeah. good stuff. Thank, thank you for that. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm going to implement some of those into my own daily gardening okay, activities. Okay, so you I let appreciate me know that. how it goes. All right, we'll do that. Thank you much. Thank you. Right. It's time to side dress the corn. You don't typically side dress corn when it gets about a foot tall, about knee high, a little less than knee high. We have some varying sizes here. Some of this corn has been more successful at grabbing fertilizer than the other. So we're going to try to equal things up a little bit. General rule of thumb on the amount of uh, side dress nitrogen, and nitrogen is the only element you need to apply in a side dress. We've already taken care of the phosphorus and potassium needs out here. Uh, uh, is one pound, uh, 16 ounces, uh, 3400 per 100 foot of row. We calculated we have about 80 foot of row here. So 12.8 uh, ounces split into two right here. I'm gonna try to put a half out at a time. and. Uh, 34.0 goes a long way, so you want to be as even with your application as you can. Uh, uh, if, you have, if you put it out too heavy in some places, you can actually cause a burn. Now I'm going to apply the other half. I want the fertilizer to go on the ground, not on the plant, because it can actually burn the foliage if you get it on the foliage. Well, that should give us the nitrogen that we need, should need to make a good crop of sweet corn. All right, here's our Q&A segment. Andrea, you jump in there with us. Do you have anything to say, all right? All right, sounds all right. good. Thank you for having me. Are y'all ready? These are good questions. Yeah. Here's our first viewer email. What is the best way to get rid of moles in your lawn? That has got to be one of the <laughs> top questions we get in extension throughout the state. Yes. Walter, yes. how do we get rid of those moles? <laughs> well, you know, I really like to use harpoon traps. Okay, all right. Uh, that's one, you know, good way to get, you know, to get them. Okay. Now, also, if you have uh, uh, some dogs and some cats, mm -hmm. we'll also uh, uh, dig them up and get them as well. I've also seen coyotes. Oh, yeah, no, but I don't know if you want coyotes. In the yard. <laughs> right. So you know, right. but uh, you know, I've seen that happen. Now, they're, 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 what they're after? They're after the grubs. Yes. Uh, that, that's off in there. And if you really just take a sharpshooter and just kind of lift your soil up a little bit, you'll see those grubs laying there. Now, some people will say uh, use granular seven, mm -hmm. yeah, you I know, to kill the grubs. The only problem I don't like doing that is because you're also going to kill earthworms. Right. Mm -hmm. And earthworms are part of the diet for the mold. For the mold. So, yeah, you well, can get rid so. of the grubs, but right. if the earthworms are still there, guess what? They're yes. still going to eat. Right. Yes. Right. And I will tell you another little oddball thing about the, the, the moles. They're actually, those tunnels do provide oxygen down there for the roots. Uh, but you might not want the, you know, you might not want the tunnels in your yard. Right. But I, I really recommend the harpoon traps. I've heard people talk about the chewing gum. I have to. I, that's nothing to that. Uh, I've heard people talk about pouring ammonia uh, down off in the holes. Yes. I don't know if I want to do that Castor or not. Castor being. Yes, I, I've heard all that. But right. uh, but really, if you ever have a dog or cat that'll dig them up and get them, that, that's a good route to get them. Or they're pretty active first thing in the morning. Yes. So if you can get behind them with a sharpshooter or a shovel, yes, you can flick them out the ground. Oh yes, yeah. yes, you yes. Can do that route. Yeah, you can go that yeah. route. You yeah. go that route. Humanely. Um, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. You have to figure yes. out what you're gonna do with them. Right. Well, you know, once you flick it out, 
Uh, but yeah, I, we get this question so often about the moles, mm -hmm. and they can be a problem. They can be a big they can problem. Be a problem. You know, yeah. they're just they're tunneling through, you know, just trying to find food, of course. Uh, and, and another reason why I think we're seeing them so much now is because the ground is so moist and saturated. Mm -hmm. So it's easy for them to swim that's through right. the soil, if you will. Yes. So I think that's why you see so many of the runs or tunnels, if you will, right. because it's just been so wet. Yes. The ground is so yes. moist, so saturated, and it's easy again for them to get through that soil because right. it's been moist and saturated. Good luck with those moles, Kevin. <laughs> Thank you for the question. All right, here's our view, next viewer email. I found a cross vine growing in my George Tabor azalea. It is very beautiful. Will it hurt my azaleas if I leave it? And this is Miss Elsie in Millington. That cross vine is a beautiful vine, as you can see growing there. Yes, it, it is pretty. Will grow like crazy. Yes. Right. Likes full sun, can grow in partial shade. Azaleas like partial shade. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. It can cover up those azaleas if you're not careful. So okay. here's my question, Ms. Elsie. What do you want? Which one do you want? Yeah. You want the cross vine? Do you want the azaleas? Right. All right. Because there's going to be competition there mm -hmm. eventually. All right. So you have to make a decision. It's a beautiful vine, but you have beautiful azaleas. Let me ask this question. Right. Do they both like acidic soils? Cross I vines can. I know the uh, azaleas for sure. Cross vines, yes. Can actually deal with it, yes. And, and obviously from the picture, it looks good, so it's growing pretty yes, well. Yes, yes, right. yes. It's growing yes. pretty well. Uh, but that's, that would be my only question, okay. you know, Miss Elsie, you know, which, which one do you want? You can have, if you want both, that's fine. Right, it's your landscape, that's fine. Um, but do know, very aggressive growers. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right, and it will take over. It's beautiful, okay? Here's our next viewer email. Uh-oh. <laughs> How do you get rid of monkey grass? This is Andrew right here in Memphis. The old Ariope, all right? Yes. How would you get rid of? First, it's going to take about, I don't know the situation, <laughs> but it's going to take about two to three years oh, oh, wow. to get rid of it. Right. But what I would do, I would go out and dig it up. Okay. And then as you see those little shoots or whatever that's right. left. The little rhizomes? So. Yes, just, you, you just have to hit it with something that contains glyphosate. Okay. And just know that it's going to be a battle for about two years, about two, three years. But eventually you, you, you'll win that war. All right. You'll eventually win it. But uh, it's just going to take some time to get it. But definitely dig out the ones that obviously that you see, those big clumps. Just go in and dig them up get them out of there. Right. Yeah, that's good. And I can tell you what I've done, Andrew, from experience, right? Okay. So we're actually trying to remove some Liropi, monkey grass. We cut it back. We need a lawnmower. Allow it to regrow, re-sprout. Young green tissue. Yes. We sprayed it with the product that contained glyphosate, mm -hmm. right? Start to knock it out, okay, a little bit. But then this was during the summer. We actually covered it with black plastic. Okay. Yep. Got real hot under there. Yeah. Right. So it really, you know, knocked it back. Yes. And then later on that summer, mm -hmm. we started digging it out. Right. Okay. Right. So yeah. we cut it, sprayed mm -hmm. it, covered it with black plastic. Yeah. This was in the summertime. It was real hot. Yeah. Right. Knocked it back considerably. And mm -hmm. then we dug out what we could. Now, you yeah. got to get all of that root system out. It, it's, right? yeah, it's, it's, yeah. a, it's a little bit of a Because if not, it will come back with a vengeance. Yes. <laughs> like, uh -huh. Yeah, you take it <laughs> off. Back. Right. So you got to be careful with that. But, you know, that's, yeah. What you yeah. said is fine. And, yeah, this is, you know, from my, you know, personal experience. And it yeah. did work. But it will take some time. You yeah, get all of those uh, roots out of there. Good luck to you, Andrew. Good luck. All right. <laughs> Hope that helps. Here's our next viewer email. We have a walnut tree. And there are worms in the nuts. What can we do to get rid of the worms and save our huge tree? It is over 50 years old and we don't want to lose it. Mm. This is Sharon from Delano, Tennessee. Yes. So, worms, walnut tree, okay? How do we get rid of those worms? Well, what are those worms? Well, yeah, worms? that's the first yeah. thing. Uh, and it, is, it would be some type of, what, uh, curculio? Right, uh, it's the black walnut curculio. Yes, right. yes, so that's... And now, how to get rid of it? Now, I know, uh, like a product like Dur's Band or Lauren's Band is labeled for it, but I don't know how a homeowner could uh, spray it or whatever to, you know, you, you know, to take it out. Right. Um, 
Uh, there is one little side note I wanted to say about black walnut trees. Okay, sure. They can produce walnuts for like 250 years. Wow. Yeah. So it's one of the few things that really, you know, can last in a family for generations. Wow. Yes. Literally. Yeah, literally. So, wow. but but back to point. Yes, as it's, it's got it's that little curculeo worm right. that you mentioned. That's what it is. Now there's also another uh, worm that probably larva, I should say, right. that gets confused, and that is that husk fly. Right. Uh, but it doesn't get into the kernel. Right. Uh, that I know of, it doesn't. Uh, so like you say, that's that's what the problem yeah, is. Yeah, the curculio does. Right, you know, it gets feed to the kernel. On the kernel mm -hmm. itself, because the the adult female would actually chew a hole in the husk. That's right. Mm. Right, as that fruit is starting to develop and lay her eggs. Of course, the eggs hatch. The larva then start to feed on the mm -hmm. kernel. The kernel. Right, which will cause it to drop, which is what we call June drop. Yeah. Right. So this usually happens usually between April and June, July. Right. So, of course, when it drops, hits the ground, that larva is still feeding. Once it finishes feeding, it pupates into the ground. Yes. Comes back as an adult to go right back into the tree again. Wow. Yeah. It's tough yeah. to control, you know. Yeah. Because you, you, know, you mentioned a couple, uh, cobberill is, you know, something yes. that you, but again, as a homeowner, it's a 50 year old tree. Yes. This tree is probably huge. Yeah. So it'd be hard to get out there with a, yeah, trying to yeah, trying spray. To spray. That, so, uh, I wish be I tough. had better news for. Yeah, that's that's gonna be a tough one, Miss Sharon. Yes. But I mean, now you do know what it is. Uh, maybe there's someone in the area that could help you with that. You know, maybe another farmer or something like that. Right. Or, you know, that has uh, you know, one of these trucks that has this little right blower. Yeah, they can you know, blow it up you in can there. Blow it up through there like they have at the orchards and things mm -hmm. like that. Right. Uh, but yeah, you have the decision to make. You know, whether you want to do it or not. Right. Right. Because uh, this black, black walnut curculio can cause some problems. Yes. Sorry for the bad news, Ms. Sharon. All right. So, Walt, Andrea, it's been fun. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for right. having me. It's been fun. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplots 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016 or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Need gardening advice? Go online to familyplotgarden.com. There are tons of videos from the show and links to extension publications from all over the country. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plots, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.